Welcome back around theCUBE's live coverage here in Las Vegas for HP Discover 2024. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE with Dave Vellante, my co-host and co-founder. Brett Hanlis here, Corporate Vice President and the CMO, Chief Market Officer Intel. Brett, thanks for coming on theCUBE, great to see you. Oh, thanks for having me at the end of a very long day. Exciting day, Dave. Yeah, yeah, we're just getting started. <laughs> we got the big show tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Going to go hang out with the deadheads. Oh, in the, in the sphere, yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty impressive. It's, it's been great. Impressive. Thanks for your support. The audience loves the content. I want to give a shout out to Intel, sponsoring theCUBE, appreciate that. Let's get into it. We are living in a revolution time. It's a systems revolution. Everyone's talking about the hype, which is a lot of overhype on AI. But at the end of the day, you're seeing a, a conversation where the user experiences are being impacted. Yep. But all the work is being done at the infrastructure to power up the hardware and the gear and the horsepower, because the developer's going crazy. People can see use cases, but there's a lot more work to get done. You guys are in the middle of this across the ecosystem. How do you see it? How do you look at that market? Give us your, your, your hot take. Yeah, I mean, the, the key word there is ecosystem and system. I think we we're talking about this in just prior to going live. But if you have a look at Intel, obviously people associate us with CPUs, GPUs, NPUs. Um, and we've been doing a lot, obviously, at that component level. So just embedding features like advanced matrix extensions into the CPU itself. Um, because what we see is people are looking to those huge, large language models, running tens of thousands of servers, and, and you know, obviously exabytes of data. Not everyone has access to those things. Um, but luckily, I think we're moving into a world where we can take those models that are already trained on these huge systems by others, and then integrating them into our own infrastructure and business use case, to, to your point. So what we're trying to do is bring AI compute power into architectures people already understand, know, and use today. So things like we announced today, the HP, uh, HPE ProLiant 380A, I've got to get these acronyms and names right. <laughs> yeah. um, but wow. their server is embedding our new Xeon 6 technology, which has embedded AI capability. So rather than having to go retrain, yeah. you know, all these you know, infrastructure teams that you talked about, you can actually leverage the architectures that you have today. So Intel's great at democratizing compute. Um, we really are just trying to play that role in the AI space. So it's not just the high end with the people with the large wallets. How do we get it into everyday infrastructures and data centers and also out to PCs so people can get the value out of AI? You're seeing people, yeah. you're seeing the use case certainly on the enterprise side as, I won't say optimistically cautious, maybe I'll say that because they see the consumer side where they need all that horsepower and investment and then with the enterprise, although they have the hype on it, there's data security challenges and then fragmented data estates. Right. So their existing architecture is knows has to be kind of re-looked at, but they already have all their systems in place. And they're doing things like retrieval, kind True. of low-hanging use cases, but have a gen AI feel. Yep. So in your mind, Take us through the progression of how you see Gen AI playing out from the store, uh, from that enterprise standpoint. Do they knock down some singles, low-hanging fruit? Yep. And then where does it go to? Yeah, no, look, honestly, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. So if we take these open source models that are pre-trained to your industry, your type of enterprise, and then we can run it on our infrastructure as is today with the new features that we're implementing, then really we can start to run these models on the standard infrastructure and just try to you know, put a toe in the water, if you like. So it's not these yeah. big bang projects that have to, you have to spend tens of millions on. We can actually yeah. start to experiment with it. And you mentioned it true with the RAG, yeah. where we can take enterprise data in the systems today and augment, if you like, these open source models so you get a more accurate and real-time view coming from your Gen AI workloads. Because um, that's the thing, if, you, if you're running a, a model that's been trained on someone else's data yeah. that is many, many years old, we need to embed these, the, you know, today's data yeah. and your enterprise data to make this stuff more valuable. Uh, and that's really where we see it going, right? From a marketing executive standpoint, yeah. new challenges. Uh, I've got my Intel Evo, Evo <laughs> Intel Inside. Which I'm very, very grateful for. Right, right. and so right, the, that's so well known. But, but now we're entering this new era. You're talking about processor diversity, you're talking about a systems view, a lot, new, a lot of new buzzwords, RAG, nobody heard of RAG you know, two years two ago. Two years ago, or even right? two months ago. Yeah, 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 right. yeah. Yeah. Actually, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. So how do you think about that from a, a marketing executive standpoint? How do you get the message out and keep it sustainable like you did with Intel Inside, which was amazing? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the beauty of Intel Inside was that it was a thing people could look to and understand the experience that's been built into a device. Right? And at the time in the 90s, PCs were based on the CPU. 
right? right. It, the CPU was the heart of the PC experience. You wind the clock forward a few decades, and the Intel Inside message has to expand to modern use cases. So for me, Intel Inside means beautiful, immersive experiences, right, for the consumer. Uh, and we work obviously with all of our hardware partners to not only have a high performance CPU in there, but what is the screen experience? What's the memory experience? How do we build something that people will enjoy as soon as they open the laptop? So as a marketer, it's really projecting Intel is bringing all this value to the ecosystem above and beyond the CPU. And obviously AI is another step forward on that. So what is the Intel value to an AI deployment? And it's so many things. So it's the software that we write. It's the optimization of models. We've, I think we've optimized over 500 of these open source models on Intel hardware. So when you get it out of the box, do, you know, integrate with yeah. your business, you know it's going to perform. Um, you know, we have our own products like OpenVINO, which again is open source. We're all about opening the AI ecosystem and making sure that people aren't necessarily locked into one environment, they have choice, just as they did, you can walk into Best Buy and choose what laptop suits you in your moment. We want to do the same with AI. We want people to have choice. And that's really where, from a marketing standpoint, we're trying to explain this is an ecosystem play, it should be an open play, uh, and we're working with all, all sorts of partners in the ecosystem to try and drive that home. As a marketer, it's hard to keep a very, very simple message over something quite complex. Yeah. But we are doing our best, and I think you'll see you know, new things coming out from us in the next few months where we start to hone in on a yeah. common theme across all of these architectures. And you've used this concept of a continuum, AI yeah. continuum. John and I and the Cube Research team developed the, we have the AI power law, because right. uh, we said it's not going to just be big, giant models yeah. and training, it's going to be industry-specific models and Specialty models. maybe smaller models, and so it's similar, but can you explain your point of view on the continuum? Yeah, I mean, I think really what we're seeing now is the spread of AI workloads to where it most makes sense, right? A lot of us are obviously caught in the hype of these LLMs that run in the cloud and you know, huge amounts of investments to run them. But if we think about things like edge AI, yeah. in other words, in a telco network, where they're trying to balance workloads in real time, then you should have AI compute closest to where the network is making decisions. And that's not necessarily in the data center or in the cloud. So we're actually optimizing things with our Tiber Edge platform, which is AI, you know, aware, enable, to allow you know, virtual RAN networks for telcos to optimize in real time. So that's one use case. The other one is obviously the explosion of AI use cases on the PC, so the whole AI PC thing. And just enabling things such as our Core Ultra um, processor uh, in the vPro devices as well, that enables you to run better creativity apps, all right? We can do, write an 80s pop song for me, right? So you yeah. train the LMM yeah. somewhere, but you actually actually compose the music on your laptop versus the low latency, the high latency that you may have talking to a cloud. If you want real-time creative output, music output, then wouldn't it be great to have the PC being the hub of that compute? Um, and then obviously the network in between. So we're yeah. inserting ourselves into how do we get these racks within the rack, across the racks, on open standards like Ultra yeah. Ethernet. So really this continuum of compute, cloud, data center, edge, PC, is what we're trying to optimize for everyone. <laughs> it's funny, the game still remains the same, but the, the landscape changes, it's funny. Yeah. You know, because the AI PC is simply just more of a powerful device yeah. connected on a network and distributed computing. And you brought up that because that brings up also the cost factor. One, yeah. one of the things we're seeing is that AI everywhere in everything. And, and the theme we've been hearing over the past year at going to events is we're going to infuse AI into everything. That's what customers' mindset is. And they start to figure out what that is. But cost is an issue, right? It and is. what they ex have existing. So how do you enable an existing customer in the enterprise to say, hey, I've invested in all this over the decades in my data center, cloud, whatever. Now I want to infuse AI, like say the PC, it makes total sense. I'll run an open source model on my PC and not have to pay yep. the fees to host it and pay the whatever, yep. uh, the GPU cycles, whatever it's going to cost. That's innovation, but it's baby steps, but it's also still relevant totally. to the hardware build out. So we're seeing that test toe, you said toe in the water, totally true. What's next? Because the progression would be, okay, more adoption. 
And so AI adoption becomes now the benchmark. What's your view on, on AI? It reminds me of online on the web. More online users met better search engine, eventually. Right. Are we having similar experience with AI where it's general relationship needs more adoption, more progress? What's I your view on so. that? I think so, and you've probably heard it too, guys. Like, people are trying to achieve things and the projects haven't produced you know, against yeah. the promise that everyone is making of it. You know, if you look at the, the Gartner hype cycle, are we the peak of in, inflated yeah. <laughs> expectations or are we in the trough of disillusionment? I would argue Gen AI is coming out of that trough, to be quite honest. Um, but if you have these high profile expenses that haven't delivered a result, people mm -hmm. obviously get a little bit reticent. And so I think there's an opportunity to have a look at your current data center. Mm -hmm. People can't afford necessarily to insert more compute into there. They're either running out of real estate, running out of power in the power envelope. So how do you optimize your data center to give space yeah. to try these new experiences? Do you even need GPUs? Mm -hmm. Can you use the existing infrastructure to run these inference models? So I think really if we can unlock this investment that you've already made in the data center, then you can experiment with these technologies and get real value to make the right conscious yeah. investment to get the results that you need. You know, yeah. I was in New York City um, for a New York Stock Exchange, it was an anniversary to celebrate uh, the Jay Shree's uh, IPO for Rista. Pat Gelsing, which I saw Pat. You saw Pat. I saw Are Pat saw Gelsing, Pat? <laughs> gave him a big okay. hug. He's been a big Cube alumni. And so, so I gave him a big hug and I said, hey, we haven't, he's been super busy, as you know, probably. He's your boss. <laughs> he's, <laughs> a, he's a hard man to get in front of. And so I'm grateful that you guys yeah, did. Well, we rendezvous, we had a small little chat and I said, how's it going? And he said, we're going to keep innovating. Pat's been on the Cube at EMC, that when he was at EMC, and then at VMware, he always had that mindset of, we're going to push the envelope. More people in cloud, more people in data center, more people on AI. What's the mindset with Pat and the team right now on the innovation? Because again, it's just the beginning, and his view is always play offense. Yeah. What is, what is, what's going on? What's the conversation <laughs> like between you and Pat right now, and, and Intel? Offensively, the positioning, I mean, the stakes are high, everyone sees it. Give us a little push taste the envelope is an understatement. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, like yeah. Push, push the envelope <laughs> of, of physics. He, he makes the envelope. <laughs> oh, he creates a new envelope. <laughs> he did, and I, and I think that's the beauty of Pat coming back to the business is that he really looked at where we were compared to where the market was, and we were even outsourcing some of our manufacturing. And what he wanted to do was get back to the core of where we were known, right? Which is high performance market-leading silicon technology, because he calls it the siliconomy, right? Silicon is embedded in everything yeah. that we do today. And what we've done is invested literally tens of billions, up to 100 billion worth, into just the manufacturing capability of silicon. Um, and just not only fixing the fragility of the supply chain with silicon, right? We saw pressures on Asia when COVID hit and suddenly silicon shortages were everywhere. If we can bring manufacturing back to the US, which we are, if we can stabilize the silicon supply chain, that's one advantage that only Intel can really bring just because of the capital you know, infrastructure that we have. So that's him pushing the envelope of investments that we can make. It's also on just the process technology. Yeah. Um, I think a little bit of friction with our partner community at the moment, our ecosystem, is that we're releasing new generations every single year, yeah? We call it yeah. the five <laughs> nodes in four <laughs> years. Now it may not mean something, it's a bone yeah. of contention for some of our partners, you, what, you got another one? Yeah. We only just absorbed your last one. But it's, it's a clear statement that we're just not only trying to catch up to yeah. where you expect us to be, but to leapfrog the competition. And that's what will happen when we release the 18A. So again, smallest transistor <laughs> known to man, 500 <laughs> tons of equipment using silicon photonics yeah. to just produce this incredibly dense power power efficient compute devices. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite fascinating. When you look at a GPU that can consume 700 watts and a hair dryer is 1500 watts, you can imagine the amount yeah. of heat that these things produce. So we're trying to yeah. innovate on the power envelope Innovate on the you know energy envelope, but also on the silicon performance. <laughs> you know, as well. John. John knows. I was I was a skeptic. Five nodes in four years. No way. So okay. We've done it though. So you did it. <laughs> Check. Now yeah. I'm like, okay. So I'm a little less skeptical. And okay. I'm saying, okay. <laughs> Backside power and gate all around. Well, together, like, okay. Yeah. Did that. Now you got 18A. Wow. Okay. 14A. You hit 14A. I'm gonna be. 
Did you have? And we've got I'll the eat a cube. To get there. We get the, we the to get there. Wow. I mean, it's really. That's what I mean. It's like more than pushing the envelope. Yep. Intel usually is the conservative one, right? In terms of process. Sure. Now you're saying, we're we're playing offense. We're going to yeah. try to leapfrog the industry. Absolutely. But, but I think to to your point about you know maybe it causes some friction in the ecosystem. But it's to me the absolute right thing to do because I think cycles are shrinking. They I think are. AI is going to accelerate well, you've the seen cycles. That with AI, and so right? you're going to have to have. It's almost like back to the remember when it was 286, 386, yeah. 486. Yeah. You always had to have the new one yeah. because it drove productivity. It did. Yeah. You know, it made you money. And people are and so, and people are putting these things together too. That's how they're putting the the technology together is also changing how they're custom building their solutions, their systems. It's almost, again, we're going to see like another wave of like large scale systems being assembled yeah. and built. That's it. And I think, I mean, to, to take your point back to the Intel, Intel and Cyber program, again, the sticker indicated excellence in the box. And that's really what I think this five nodes in four years is doing, is giving a sense of confidence to people. If Intel is in that box, you're getting the best price performance per watt. But again, I mean, I, I think what's so exciting is that 286s, 386s, yeah. 486s, okay, they're a processor, but this whole ecosystem of innovation have developed around it, and it wasn't driven by us, it yeah. was just supported and enabled by us. And that's what I'm really excited for, is that yeah. if you open the gateway of AI mm -hmm. to every developer on the planet, imagine what they could do versus a few hundred in a big bank. What is an AI developer on a PC able to develop and then scale back into a bank? And that's really what we're yeah, really working towards yeah, now. Yeah, the, this is an inflection point, clearly an inflection point, a wave big, bigger than we've ever seen before. Brett, I want to get your thoughts. We're here at HP Discover, yeah. HPE Discover. Um, you're a big partner, you mentioned ecosystem. Talk about the relationship with HPE and then talk about your priorities at Intel as CMO, as you want to take that brand next level. You got an ecosystem, the world's changing, but the game's still the same. More horsepower, powering software, now data, whole nother generation. Relationship with HP and then your priorities now. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the relationship with HP is long standing, right? And I think I love their focus in the enterprise because I'm a B2B guy, yeah. right? <laughs> so I, I come from that world and, and HPE and Intel have had just this magical relationship dating back to Compaq, dating back to mm -hmm. obviously the HP servers. And that relationship remains steady. So if you look at all of the product announcements that we made today, whether it's the 320A and the ProLine or whether it's the, the um, microcompute devices or it's the you know, low energy um, devices that we're going to be releasing later this year, the 320 and the 340. We've just got this huge roadmap of opportunity for performance and energy compute that goes into these industry standard racks, right, to develop, uh, sorry, to, to distribute and run AI models, for example. So the engineering and design work, incredibly close yeah. and aligned, which is fantastic. I think on the marketing front, and I met with Jim Jackson, he's the CMO today, there are so many places where we could play in market, and my focus for Intel is like, choose the areas where we can aim these amazing companies and their sets of resources together for the greatest good for our customers. So rather than playing in 100 places, what are the few things that would deliver real value to the most customers? And that's what we're going to workshop together and, and come out to market with. I mean, AI is obviously yeah. one space. Um, they're playing with other players in the market. I mean, NVIDIA, yeah. amazing player in the AI market. Xeons and Xeon 6s, yeah. backbone of that whole workload. We've got a fantastic place to play there. But what about modernizing the data center that's not AI? Yeah. The gen compute space the data center refresh yeah. that's happening now. Um, I think there are areas where you'll see HPE yeah. and Intel work really closely together. You know, I love the term enablement. Usually people talk with platforms or any kind of technology, the word enablement. But we are in a disruptive enablement world now. Yes. There's, there's disruption in a good way. Yeah. And that's coming, so we're getting some disruption, which means some may not be around, some things have change, change is happening, but there's an enablement. This is a huge part of what's going on right now, and you're, you're seizing that moment. Yeah, I mean, I, I think disruption is such a cool word. I mean, because, again, when you work within a company that's decades old, disrupting a way of working or disrupting 
the way that you collaborate with your partners, but also within the company, can actually be a really, really positive thing. Um, and what I really love is coming back into Intel, because I was in Intel 2000 through 2006, and it was all about the commoditization of compute into Linux servers yeah, and yeah. <laughs> Wi-Fi enabled mobile laptops. Bare metal. Yeah, it was all, all of that stuff. And what I love Open stack. <laughs> is bringing that understanding of what Intel can do. Like when it created the Wi-Fi space, here's a Wi-Fi enabled notebook, but with no network to connect to. And we worked with the Cisco's of the world, and the yeah. ATT's of the world, and McDonald's of the world, the Borders of the world, and created a Wi-Fi mesh that people could connect these devices to. I want to get back to those types of collaborative ecosystems, yeah. because again, the scale of HPE, the customer yeah. connection that they have, and just our rich sets of software and compilers and you yeah. know, enablement that just get those disruptive innovators and scale their great idea into the real world is something that I just find really I think enablement I think, is I, the operative yeah, word there. That's is, really was the is. hallmark of yeah, that, that exactly. era. I think, the, I think the Wi-Fi on the PC is a great example that why AI PC is going to work. Yeah. It, it looks like it's there now, but when it starts getting that collective people that building out. Mass, yeah. Yes, the ecosystem. Yeah. Brad, great job to have you on theCUBE. Really love the insight. Again, we're bringing all the data. I love the, the energy the, that you bring, well, guys, at the end of the day. <laughs> we love it. <laughs> <laughs> we got a rock star on. I feed on yeah, this we, stuff, we, it's we, great. We love when the tech athletes come on the theCUBE. All right, Brett, thanks for coming on. Not a problem. Okay, enjoy, guys. We're here live on the show floor in Las Vegas for HP Discover. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back for our last session of the day for day one of three days of coverage. We'll be right back. <laughs>